My phone says 7 o'clock, so let us get started so that we can give ourselves the full hour and then also be done, Lord willing, at 8 o'clock. So let us start with prayer. Heavenly Father, the truth that you reveal to us about ourselves in your word is not always an easy thing for us to hear. But by the Spirit, you have convinced us and convicted us that on our own and from birth, we find ourselves outside of your kingdom. But through that very same Spirit that has convicted us, we are convinced that Jesus has done everything for us in order that we might be brought into your kingdom by faith in him. Help us remember this truth about ourselves so that we can, with hearts of love and compassion, with a proper understanding of law and gospel, share your word with others who are caught in sin. We ask that you continue to fill us with your wisdom as we study your word. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So we find ourselves under the section today of disarming the arguments, which we find on page five in the handout that you have in front of you. Um, we were able last time as we began this, this study to get through and up to this point, and now we'll take uh, today, and probably we'll have to take maybe a little bit of another Wednesday in order to finish it up as well. But as we disarm the arguments and as we discuss these things, um, I would like you to, with the people near you, develop some points that you'd want to hit in addressing the argument that's given here next. And we're going to divide this room kind of right down the middle. So, so everybody here who's on the left side, on my left side, if you take the first starred point, um, and with the people near, near you, develop those points that you would want to hit in addressing the argument given. And everybody on my right side, um, with those people near you, take the second starred point and come up with what points you would want to hit and address in that argument given. So, give you a couple minutes. Left side here, right side here, with the people who are, who are near you. And if you want to, on the table at the end, work together, that's what you're fine. Well, 
It's always good to hear um, conversation continue because it means, um, Lord willing, the question was halfway, halfway um, good to be able to stimulate that, that discussion. But, but let's take a moment. Um, so the, the first argument is the argument that says, well, people didn't choose to have these same-sex desires. So if, if a person didn't choose to have the same-sex desires, well, how can we condemn them? What are some things that you would want to hit, some points that you would want to hit in seeking to disarm that argument on the basis of what God has revealed to us and, and taught us in his word? So I asked um, this section of the room to, to discuss it. Um, any, any thoughts that you'd like to share this side of the room? For the other side. Scott. Well, first we thought the second sentence was, was wrong. Um, who are we to condemn them? Um, shouldn't we love them and, and, and uh, appeal to, to their senses and hopefully get into a conversation? I mean, I don't know if we can walk down the street and condemn them. I, I don't think I can. And we will, we will have an opportunity to talk about that judging and condemnation in a, in a few moments with some other questions too. Um, the idea of the condemning would be to say, you're wrong in, in doing this. And, and in that regard, we would have the right to do that, but we definitely would want to do so in a way that um, is seeking to win them rather than to judge them in a sinful way. Any other thoughts? Some points that you might want to hit. Evan. Uh, we also kind of talked about, like, well, yeah, we, uh, we, if we don't choose to be born into this world as sinners, and while some of it expresses itself in one way or another, it doesn't mean that we are still not under the law for those sins that we may commit. So we're not choosing the sin or to be sinful when we are born because it's just the reality of, of the sinful nature passed down from parents. Uh, and, and we're not going to have a, a confessional booth within this class here tonight, but if all of us are honest with ourselves, we would probably have to admit that there are certain sins in our own lives that are very much... Um, difficult for us to overcome, that continuously seek to pull us back into them. It could be a sin of gossip. It could be a sin of anger. It could be a sin of greed. It could be a sin of lust. And, and how many of us would, would say that we could properly say, I didn't choose to struggle with greed. I didn't choose to struggle with anger. I didn't choose to struggle with lust. So there's some truth to that, isn't there? So the affirming the sin and then acting upon it is where the problem is, isn't it? Um, to be tempted in and of itself isn't the sin. What is the sin is then 
confirming and affirming the sin by then acting upon it. Yes, Annette? So we, we sin, and we're going to be, we're going to be splitting a hair. To a, no, no, it's, it's worth talking about. But we're going to be splitting a hair because our ability at times to simply resist a temptation and not think about it um, is it, it's very difficult because our sinful nature is with us in everything. But if, if we were to say it is a, it is a sin to be tempted, then we'd have to say Jesus sinned because he was tempted. Um, so the, it's not the temptation that's a sin, but what happens is there are many a times that we sin in the temptation. While we might not act upon it, we start thinking in a way that is sinful, um, which Jesus never did do because of his ability to resist it because he didn't have that sinful nature. So does that answer your question. <laughs> Rudy. I'll throw it back at you. When you use genetics, where are you going with it, or what are you speaking to? I'll, I'll pick up on it, because I did use the I, word. Uh, the, way, the way uh, you act, or what comes out of your life, based on the way you were born. OK. Well, and let's, let's see that the, I asked for them to explain so that I'm not trying to put words in their mouth. Um, Brad. Right, so, so we had just brought up that you know, there might be a genetic predisposition to certain things, right? Like, um, like alcoholism. Maybe there is a certain uh, predisposition to something. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it, it goes back to the simple nature. Bruce really pointed out about genetically. We all have a simple nature, right? If you talk about what we've inherited uh, from our parents. So that was the and, and that's the reason I ask what was meant by genetic. Um, genetically speaking, we are predisposed to sin because genetically speaking, we receive the sinful nature passed down to us from our parents. But there is far more scientific evidence that there could be a genetic gene for alcoholism than there is for any type of a gay gene. But here's the thing. Even with the possibility of a predisposed genetic gene for alcoholism, does anybody say alcoholism is not a sin? No. So even that argument falls flat when you stop to realize the way that we look at those type of things. Jeff? Jeff? still hold them accountable for things they do under the influence of alcohol, even though they are an alcoholic. And you could start making the same argument, well, do you hold a person who has, who has say they've been injured, they have, they've had a head injury or something, they have a predisposition to violent behavior. Do we say that, well, now you're not accountable for committing the act of murder against somebody? And so, so what, you, what you just said is if an individual were to take this argument to its logical conclusion, ultimately any and every sin has to be acceptable in one way or another. And I'm yet to still find somebody who would speak about a sin that involved stealing all of my possessions and 
harming my entire family as being okay just because they might have had a predisposition to it when they were born. Uh, and so the argument falls flat. Um, but but how do, what, what points would we want to hit? It's, it's not just a case of it, but you're choosing. It's, it's more of saying you might have this, this predisposition to, to a certain sin. The temptation isn't the problem, it's the acting upon it and affirming it by, by, by doing it that is the problem. Because God does have, say, have something to say about that. Um, and we'll take a moment to look at passages that talk about, of course, once again, how it is that we are born into this world. Um, and then you can make that argument, like I said, that ultimately, if you take this to its logical conclusion, every sin really would have to be allowed. Because somebody could claim they were predisposed to it, and it's just the way I am. Um, and so... Through faith in Christ and that loving support of, of fellow Christians, what can we say to them? Um, we can hold you accountable. Um, and people who have had those, those same sex desires can be helped to resist from acting upon them. Um, this side of the room. God so loved the world, so God loves gay people. And Jesus said that anyone who believes in him shall be saved. That too includes gay people. Um, what points would you want to bring up in countering that argument? Dave. So we ask, so God's love the world, so God loves gay people, or God loves sinners like me. True, to Jesus' work. And Jesus said that anyone who believes in him shall be saved, and he said yes. So that includes gay people. So what is the difference? Sin or struggling against it. So, recognizing the sin, being sincerely sorry for it, trying not to do it, and trusting that Jesus is our Savior. Yeah, the the statement in of itself is misleading, isn't it? It 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 lumps God's love for the sinner together with the lifestyle that the individual is living, as if God loves that lifestyle too doesn't it? But you, you rightfully said, um, the point that we want to be able to make is saying that yes, God loves a sinner. Yes, Christ died for them all. But that does not mean that God loves the lifestyle that's being embraced by the individual. Uh, faith and a willful sinning, they can't coexist. Faith and a willful sinning can't coexist. Um, it's that willful embracing that, that is the, the issue. Thank you. So let's review what the Bible says about how we are born into this world. Psalm 51.5 says, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Fill in the blanks. We are all sinful. And from what moment? Birth. We are born sinful. So see, what I, what I learned in my, my class is that there are some individuals who like discussion questions and there are some individuals who like fill in the blanks. So I'm putting all of them together. Romans 5. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sinned. For before the law was given, sin was in the world. But sin is not taken into account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? So original sin is the biblical concept that we blank the blank of Adam. Inherited, 
the sinful nature of Adam. Romans 3, all have turned away, they have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Blank, blank is good. No one. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of covetous desire. For apart from law, sin is dead. The sinful nature can only look at each commandment and blank every possible way of blanking it. Go ahead and just throw a word, the word out. I, consider. I heard consider, and what'd you say? Think of, think. think of, yep, so imagine every possible way of breaking, breaking it. I, imagine. And I come back to that illustration that I've used a number of times, is you're walking along the path and there's a park bench um, and it looks very nice and you keep on walking. But then you come along the next park bench and it looks exactly the same, but there's a sign on it, wet paint, don't touch. What do you want to do? <laughs> now there's a law. And because there's a law, the sinful nature wants to figure out what way I can possibly break it. Um, it could be dry. <laughs> James 2. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. We are guilty of breaking all of God's laws in his sight for just the tiniest infraction. And the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. Sin comes from a person's blank, blank. Um, heart would be the second one, but let's make it more personal, the first one. Own heart. Own heart. And so you consider that section of of scripture, those different points, they're all points that speak to that first starred question and argument. Um, you know, how can, how can they be, be condemned for, for having this, this type of a, a mindset or a thought? Um, because God says, this is the way that you enter into the world. You are a sinner. Um, that's the reality of the matter. Whichever one it is, it doesn't matter. What he comes to us with is saying, whichever one it is, that you might have that, that temptation toward, you cannot excuse it by saying, well, that's just this tendency that I have. Because you're born in this world sinful, and he comes and says, this is not appropriate, this is not acceptable, this is not excusable. What we will see, though, is that the Lord gives, through his gospel, the strength and the ability to fight against it. Um, to simply accept, affirm, and decide that you're going to live in it, God says, is not acceptable. A couple questions here. So um, I'm going to ask that... Um, this table, these three tables, um, take question one. List reasons it's valuable to understand that we are all born equally sinful. You can do it by yourself or you can do it together with people next to you. Um, this table here, um, these three, take question number two. Um, give some examples that people today refuse to take responsibility for their actions, that they have become experts at playing the blame game. And the two tables in the back, if you would take the two questions, what is the danger for us if we refuse to accept responsibility for our sins and continually blame someone or something else for them? And then the agree-disagree one as well. And you can do it yourself. You can talk with those around you.
All right, three tables on my right. What are some reasons it's valuable to understand that we are all born equally sinful? Gemma. Absolutely true. Why is it so valuable for us to know that? Penny. We're on equal footing as everyone else. We can't compare ourselves to others. Um, that's a very important point. If you didn't hear, um, we're on equal footing with everybody else when it comes to that, that sinfulness. Any other reasons? Carrie. Makes us recognize our need for a savior. Dave. The plank in my own eye makes it harder for me to see this that can then not wrongfully judge people. Yeah. My sin is just as serious. Um, and we've talked about that, and we'll, we'll reference that passage in a little bit too. Um, notice the, the reference to our own sin as being a plank and not just a speck. The plank is larger. Um, that's how the Lord wants us to see. Um, my sin is as serious, if not worse, than the other. Do you suppose that um, confessing this universal sin might make it so that the person that you are talking to, whether it be caught in this sin or just any sin in general, would put them a whole lot more at ease? The moment that you tell them, you know what? My sin is as serious as anything you've ever done. I've, I've, told, I've told the individuals in the Bible class um, that, I, that I have at, at the prison that, you know, in some respects, there's really not much difference between you and me. Um, I said, it just happened that, you know, the sin that you committed is something that our world looks at and sees, and rightfully so, as something harmful to society. Um, but there's really no difference when it comes right down to it. And I pray that it puts them at ease. Um, this isn't a person is sitting here to judging, judging them because they committed some crime that put them behind bars. Um, but they, they need a savior as much as I need a savior. And doesn't it also tell us, when you think about that we're all equally sinful, we're all equally responsible for the sins that we commit then too, right? Um, we, we all ultimately chose to do them. Um, it, it would be so flattering to ourselves, and it almost sounds so biblical to say, well, I was born in sin, I couldn't help it. But nobody made us sin. We've chosen every single sin that we've committed on our own. Nobody made us do it. Any other points? 
that anybody wanted to bring up? Yes, Gemma. Where, where are you going or what expe exactly are you asking? If they don't know that they were born in, I mean, if they don't understand what's going on, you know, they can't, they can't, uh, understand up here. Why am I saying that? You know, if you're like mentally ill, The reality of the matter is, and, and here's where, where the, the beautiful grace of God comes, is, is first of all, um, the waters of baptism um, reach that individual uh, just as much. But let's put this into, if you want to say, um, a more or a different scenario, which I think will help kind of explain it too, is do we ultimately say to the child who is beginning to grow and crawl that, um, oh, it's okay that you committed this sin and you didn't know any better? We don't. And, and so the, the mindset and the, the ability within that child who is, who is if you want to say, um, perfectly fine mentally, but might be the exact same level as the individual who has the mental handicap, um, is, is ultimately God comes to us and says that one is guilty as much as the next one because so it's, the same. it's the same. No matter if they understand it or not. Correct. Um, but that's, like I said, that's where the beauty of God's word comes in and the, and the blessings of baptism to cover those, to cover those sins as well. What about these three tables? Examples that people today refuse to take responsibility for their actions that they have become experts at playing the blame game. Pastor. Any other examples? Karen. People that don't go to church and say that they pray at home, which I've heard numerous times. Well, I don't go to church on Sundays, but I believe and I pray at home. Scott. I'm not hurting anybody else. Evan. Um, some of the more So it's actually okay if I do it because of the fact that I am becoming a problem if I'm going and obeying the law. So the reason I ask this question um, is, is not just to point the finger at out there. It, it really is a twofold. Number one is in all of these questions and recognizing that we're all equally sinful, um, there needs to be a self-examination of ourselves. In what, in what areas are we playing the blame game when it comes to our very own sin? But the second reason that I, I bring it up is also in the whole idea of disarming the arguments is understand what people are being told or the mindset that is, is there. Have you ever noticed that 
what ultimately has taken place in society is that when a sin such as this comes to light, and what does science and, and medicine very clearly show to us? That the homosexual lifestyle is very bad for people medically speaking. Um, a lot of diseases are passed on by it. But what has society said? There's not anything wrong with the act. Let's just make the act more safe. Isn't that ultimately what has happened? And the blame game, it's, it's not the act. It's that people aren't giving me enough of the safeguards to keep it from happening. And also, what is the rhetoric that is heard by many? Um, well, it's not really your fault. It's the way you were raised by your parents. It's not really your fault. It's the bullies in school. It's not really your, and I'm not saying that there's, there's nothing in society that doesn't play a role, but in the whole process of it, what is it? It is a saying, you're not responsible for this. You don't have to fight against this. It's really everybody around you that has caused this to happen. And so recognizing that, for, them to, for, for somebody to hear that, no, this, this is your choice that you are making to affirm and continue in something that God has forbidden is going to come as a shock compared to what they are hearing in general from the people of the world. Um, in the back, um, I ask you to take those two questions. First of all, what's the danger for us if we refuse to accept responsibility for our sins and continually blame someone or something else for them. Of course, the, the, these tables have, you know, 10 people to choose for, to answer, and you guys have three. <laughs> Doesn't that mean that I think very highly of the table or something? Yeah, That's, we, we fool ourselves, don't we? We lie to ourselves if, if we think that there is, is no sin. Um, and that passage, you know, brings out at the end, and the truth isn't in us if we don't accept responsibility for our sins. I'm um, agree, disagree. If you are born a certain way, there's nothing that can be done. God must be approving. God, in fact, must have made you that way. Go ahead. And, and that second part of what you said is such a, a, an important thing to keep in mind, right? It's precisely because of that nature that Christ needed to come into this world. And think about how the Bible speaks about when the individual is brought to faith. What happens? There is a new birth. Um, completely different from the way in which we entered naturally. Um, he specifically came to give us that new birth. Yes, Gemma. somebody that they think that's higher up in, in what they know 
And there's an important thing for us to kind of understand in going through this, this study is, is it possible for people to be brainwashed? And the answer is yes, um, absolutely it's possible. But what we're talking about is when we have the opportunity to talk to somebody who maybe says, I've been brainwashed. Now let's be able to say, well, let's, let's talk about this. Um, and let's, let's go back to, to a, a place where there's some absolute truth. Sure. And and ultimately, ultimately, brainwashing takes place in the. You could really say it's it's filling the void that is there because an individual doesn't have Christ with whatever is being spewed by, by, by the world. And so, so we, we, look at it, we look at it that way and we say, okay, let, let me share with you um, something that can fill that void that is, that is truth. Next question. How does overlooking other sins of sexual immorality or simply handling them differently, such as pornography, sexual prom promiscuity, um, cohabitation, no-fault divorce, how does that hurt our chances of helping those who struggle with homosexuality? What is that? Keyword? It's sleeping around. <laughs> sleeping around. <laughs> sleeping around. That's what it means. So how does that hurt our chances of helping those who struggle with homosexuality? Rick? Because now it's, it's normalized. I mean, it's just something that happens every day. People don't think twice about it. Oh, okay, that's okay. So we normalize those sexual sins. Only going to happen that we normalize the, sexu the, the sexual sin of homosexuality. But what if, we, what if we are quick to point out homosexuality as a sin, but we handle all the other ones differently? Okay, we're hypocritical. Still a sin. But will the person who is caught in the sin of homosexuality think about how you view their sin? As if it's worse. That this is actually a sin that is far worse than all these other ones if we decide that we're just going to deal with those other ones differently. Um, guess what? More than likely, we'll lose the audience pretty quickly if that's the impression that we're going to give. Um, let's look closely at John 3.16. What truths about sinners are we to come to from this passage? So, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So what truths about sinners do we come to from that passage? Annette. Okay, God loved the world, which is everybody. Dave, did you have another one? Or was that the one you had? God wants everyone to be saved. God wants everybody to be saved. Penny. If we don't believe in Jesus, we will perish. If we don't believe in Jesus, we will perish. If you believe in Jesus, you have eternal life. And we take this passage, of course, with the, with the rest of Scripture. You could say what? God loved us in spite of our sin. And we can say, Without God's love, as it was rightfully said, if we don't believe in Jesus, without God's love, we'll perish. And then in here, too, to turn to Jesus and believe in him also means turning from sin. 
Because how can one love a Savior if that same one loves the sin that the Savior came to die for and to remove? Um, In the same way that we, we cannot say that I can love God and the things of this world the same or that I can say that I would love, you know, I've used the illustration before, right? Um, if, if an individual says that I, I love my wife, but I, I've got a fling on the side, but don't worry, honey, I love you just as much as I love them, it's not going to fly, Well, it doesn't fly to say that I love you, Jesus, but I love this sin just as much. And to continue in it is ultimately saying that very thing. How does Romans 6, 1 to 7 address the argument in favor of homosexuality, which looks to pervert John 3, 16, as it turns that passage into a license to sin? So so what does this say that says that John 3, 16 isn't a license to sin? What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. So so ultimately, what does Paul teach? Love for Jesus equals... What's... I, I didn't hear what you was said. I'm not saying you're wrong what you said. I'm just saying I didn't hear. Evan. Love for uh, Jesus is living a, sanctified, a life of sanctification. Okay, living a life of sanctification. Certainly says that. What else might we say as, as far as, as a way that we could respond? Uh, love for Jesus is... Living for Jesus. Um, absolutely, those words are saying that. What else could we say? There's different ways we could say it. What is the opposite of love? Love for Jesus is hating sin. Yeah. It's really a good way to think of the first commandment and the the what does this mean? To fear, love, and trust in God above all things. What does it mean to fear God? To hate the things he hates and love the things he loves. That's what it means to fear God above all things. Um, You know, if you you kind of put it into a into a little bit of an illustrative point, you know, if if mom comes out, you've been playing in the mud. And, and, and dad told you you were not supposed to be playing in the mud at all. Um, and so, so mom comes out and you know, saves you from dad's wrath by, by cleaning you up so that, that you're, not, you're not in that mud anymore and dad doesn't see you. Um, if you return to that mud outside, what are you ultimately saying? You're showing a lack of love for your mom and you're also going to bring upon you the wrath of dad. So if our Savior has cleaned us up, but we just willfully and gladly go back and into the sin and live in it, we show a lack of love for our Savior, and why would we be surprised that we would incur the wrath of God then? 1 Corinthians 5. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that does not occur even among pagans. A man has his father's wife, and you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have been filled with grief and have put out of your fellowship the man who did this? 
Even though I am not physically present, I am with you in spirit. And I have already passed judgment on the one who did this, just as if I were present. When you are assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus, and I am with you in spirit, and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan, so that the sinful nature may be destroyed and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? I have written you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral, or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. But now I am writing you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or a slanderer, a drunkard or a swindler. With such a man do not even eat. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked man from among you. Um, so agree or disagree? God does ask his people to judge others. Rudy. I agree. Explain. Explain. Okay, and, and in removing the plank from our own eye, the judging is always going to be and needs to be in a rescue effort, right? And not in a um, condemning attempt. Um, it doesn't take long, though, does it, to read through the Bible and, and realize that God is, is asking us um, to make judgment on things in this world constantly, aren't we? Um, as he talks about the things that we're supposed to stay away from, how are we supposed to do stay away? No, if we stay away from them, well, we judge what is it that they're saying? What are they teaching? Um, what is this? Is this good for my spiritual well-being, or is this not good for my spiritual well-being? The only way we can do those type of things is if we are making judgments again and again and again. Um, we hear how Noah judged the world, and Moses judged Pharaoh. Um, what would happen, question, next question, if we did not judge one another, if we did not point out sin? <clears throat> another Sodom and Gomorrah. We would perish, wouldn't we? Isn't ultimately the pointing out of sin, but also the then forgiving of sin, or perhaps pointing out sin and not forgiving sin, the ministry of the keys that are spoken of in Scripture? Um, if you happen to have a catechism at home, take out that catechism and read through the ministry of the keys section over the next week as part of your devotion. The special power and right that God gives to believers to forgive the sins of the repentant or to refuse forgiveness to the unrepentant. Based on Jesus' words, peace I leave with you. If you forgive anyone their sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Um, we are simply exercising the keys. Yes, Gemma? if you have one. The catechism, um, and I would, I would, I'll say to you, because you don't have a catechism on your shelf, um, but you do have the catechism in, in form in the back of the instruction book, the, the BIC class that we went through. Um, the catechism are six chief parts of, of the Bible that were, were put together um, at the time of Martin Luther and a, a catechetical exercise is, is a case of where you, you kind of study by, by reviewing and reviewing and going over again and again and again, oftentimes and can be sometimes in a question and answer format, but um, reviewing again and again. And Luther found that people at the time of the Reformation were very ignorant about the truths of the Bible. So he, he put into a shortened form 
the, the truths of the Bible, such as the commandments, um, the truth about what the creed proclaims, the truth about baptism and, and Holy Communion, um, what is being taught in the Lord's Prayer, um, the ministry of the keys and confession. Um, and he put it into a booklet format so that there could be this review of what the Bible teaches. Because really within those six chief parts, all of the teachings of the Bible can be found. But it's put in summary form. Um, like I said, in the back of your BIC book that you have, all those six chief parts are written back there. The commandments, the creed. Um, but we have... Um, it doesn't look like we have a catechism up there, but I, I have catechisms up in the, in the um, cupboards in the office. I told you, hold on to the book, because it was going to be a great resource. I did. Oh, yep, I did. I tell everybody. <laughs> but I, I am happy to help you out with, uh, with, with others. If, so. um, in 512, Paul says it's not his business to judge those outside the church. What insight do we gain here on talking about homosexuality with people who do not claim to be Christian. Jeff. We need to lead them to Christ before we maybe start having the hard discussion. What a value, oh, I think I cut you off. It looked like you were gonna say more. Nope, that oh. was it. I, what a valuable comment um, and a valuable truth to keep in mind is the place to start isn't with that sin. The place to start um, isn't addressing the homosexuality in that case. Um, live with the light of Christ shining and bring them to Christ. And in bringing that individual to Christ, um, then, all right, you can talk about general repentance. And when you talk about general repentance, then you can start talking about specific sin. And then when you start talking about specific sin, if they've been brought to Christ, the prayer is, they'll say, oh, this isn't the way he wants me to be living either. You know, once in a while, just by the grace of God, the Lord allows, allows us to, to see those things too. I remember very clearly, um, and I was dealing with somebody who, who did know the truth of God's word, at least at one point in their life. Um, but they were, they were still a member of, of the congregation that I served. Um, and I was simply kind of getting to know people who had not been in worship, worship in the years that I had been there. So um, here was an individual who had never been in worship, but, but in the process of getting to know them, found out that they were living together with, with their their um, boyfriend, and they had two children. And um, so I said, you know what would be really great? Um, would be great if you took a big class. And this was after um, kind of indicating that maybe, maybe she wanted to get married. And so I said, well, let's take the big class. Went through the big class. Um, didn't, didn't talk about the situation that they were in at that time. Get, lay down the foundation of God's word, get to the sixth commandment. And in the process of the sixth commandment, the individual looked at me and said, I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing, huh? Um, God's word works. Um, we, we lead them, we want to lead them to Christ. Um, as, as Christ gives that opportunity to, to be able to show them that, that sin. Yes, Rudy. Two comments on that. First of all is 
Yes, we do want to avoid participating in such a way that their lifestyle would influence into a negative way. Do understand, though, that the Apostle, as the Apostle Paul speaks in the section we just read and talking about avoiding, he isn't talking about avoiding in the sense of saying, um, we have nothing to do with this world. He's talking about this individual who's in the midst of a Christian congregation. Um, and he's specifically saying that, that, that avoiding is the way in which you are going to demonstrate to them that what they are doing is sinful. Um, what he is really referring to is you are participating with that individual. You are chumming around with that individual and giving that individual the impression there is nothing wrong with him being shacked up with his more than likely mother, um, stepmom. And, and so, so he says avoid him because that's how he's going to come to realize that this is something. It's, he's, he's speaking about excommunication. Avoid him in, in that setting. But he's not saying, all right, so if, if he happens to be um, you know, your, your son in this congregation, that you need to kick him out of the house now. Um, because he's speaking about that setting. But there are plenty of passages in God's word that does speak to us words of warning about our participation with the things of this world. And, and so we're going to have to ask ourselves questions of, is my participation, you know, if, is me going to play tennis with somebody caught in a sin going to encourage that individual in their sin? Um, if so, I might need to avoid. But in many respects, Am I going to play tennis with an individual that I've witnessed to a number of times that what they're doing is contrary to God's word, but I'm continuing to keep a friendship line open is not something that the Lord tells me I have to avoid. But now this individual asks me to go to a party that glorifies a specific sin that they're caught in. Now I don't go and I avoid because that very clearly gives them a wrong impression and puts me and my spiritual well-being in danger. So there's going to be those different situations that we do need to examine in our own lives. Um, but this one specifically is not speaking about, it's, it's, he's speaking to a, a, a group of people who are believers. Um, that's probably, I was going to say we could take the next um, two questions, but I, I, let's, let's just wait on that so that we don't go too late. Um, and we'll pick up there with the, the idea of judging and, and how do we understand those other words then if we've been saying, yes, we judge. Well, then why does Jesus say what he does? Let us close, close with prayer. O oh, Savior Jesus, apart from you, we would be lost. Apart from you, we would not know the truth about our Heavenly Father. We would not know the way to be in a right relationship with our Heavenly Father, and we would not be able to know how it is that our sins are forgiven. But you have revealed the Father to us, and through your life and death and resurrection, you have paid the penalty for our sins. And in sending the Spirit into our hearts through your word, you have brought us to faith that we might know that our sins are forgiven. Help us to remain humble in the recognition of our own sinfulness, but confident that we are truly and fully forgiven. And in that confidence, let us share your word with others with that same confidence that it can work in their heart as well. We ask for your blessings upon our evening as we go our separate ways. Continue to watch over us and bless us with every physical and spiritual blessing that you have in store for us. We pray these things in your name. Amen.